I guess. Um, so some of the goals that we arrived at for feature storage project or feature, yeah, feature storage project was um, we, they really wanted to be able to share features between teams and use cases so they could reduce duplicate effort. So they often found that their engineers were building features multiple times uh, and didn't know it or they would basically, it was just too hard. Uh, and so similar to that is they wanted to reduce complexity when deploying models in production. And so they found it was really common that, um, you know, different people building different models would roll their own infrastructure to serve those models uh, or to sort of make those, that data available. So for example, they would like, you know, have some key value store in Redis over here or they'd have some Postgres server or they'd have a CSV file just wrapped up in a Docker image and it was all very unstandardized and that was, um, that was a pain point. So it's, uh, another thing they wanted was to decouple feature engineering from model development. And that is um, basically to make it easier for data scientists to use features without having to do feature engineering. They could just like take some stuff that some other people had built, basically. Um, and it needs to work well with existing tools. And a key part is it needs to support real-time features. So um, it also needs to support batch features. I mean, they want to be able to deal with batch feature data, but um, real-time data is something that they didn't have. That's a, like, a big thing. And so some key non-goals. Uh, Feast is not a feature engineering tool. It doesn't actually help you make features. Um, and so initially we thought feature engineering is just like one big problem we'll try to tackle in one go, but feature creation is like a way bigger problem than feature hosting. <laughs> so you, like rather than just drag ourselves down into the site, let's build a general purpose compute platform framework, which we <laughs> you can end up going down. Uh, we just thought, okay, let's just worry about the hosting and serving and deployment DevOps. Um, and so it's not a general purpose database. It's also equivalently not a general purpose data warehouse. So uh, it tries to be, you know, just suit the needs that it needs. Um, yeah, and so we do also don't support these complex features, which is kind of a, uh, des a design decision we arrived at late just to sort of um, scale back the complexity of things again. Uh, this is a weird diagram, but bear with me. <laughs> so basically, um, in the online models case, this is one of the motiv most motivating use cases was uh, when they deploy the model, they have some uh, well, I mean, I call this a gateway, but I kind of mean a model server like Selden or something. And then you have the actual model itself. So the model itself, you know, takes some entity attributes and returns a prediction. But from the client, you only get an entity ID. Something has to happen in between there. And so one approach to do that is to pre-compute your features. And in online models, that's the generally the way to make things faster. Right? So to optimize the serving speed. So you basically want to reduce the time between the, um, the request and response to the client. You don't want to be doing feature engineering on demand. So you need some kind of store for your features to look things up by ID. That's kind of the motivation for a feature store. Uh, initially, they were sort of wrapping all this up in one CSV file and bundling it into the Docker image and it all have to fit in memory and Apart from that having scalability problem, that also means you can only update that feature every time you deploy, and they want it to be able to update on demand. So what is Feast? I think I'm going to be very fast, by the way. I hope that's OK. <laughs> um, I forgot to mention I'm incredibly jet lagged because I flew in from Singapore. That's my excuse. <laughs> um, so basically, Feast is this bit that fits in between your modeling and your feature engineering. But in practice, you often do data transformations in the actual sort of model at the, as a sort of a last step anyway. So it kind of just fits in this sort of gray zone between after data transformations, doing as much pre-computed as possible. Um, so Feast um, basically, uh, is a way to collect features from different batch and streaming sources. I'll show you an architecture diagram soon. <laughs> but um, so it can read things in from CSV files or PubSub or uh, Kafka or 
BigQuery tables. And so in that sense, it's kind of like a pull or you push things to it system. Um, like it doesn't actually go and look up your data from where it lives. It actually, it actually ingests it into a system. Um, uh, and this is, you know, in some ways, I think that this is our first stab at a feature store. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the one feature store. So um, I should mention that this is not yet like a Kubeflow component. This is like a, in some ways, a proposal for Kubeflow component, <laughs> uh, something we're working towards. Um, but the what it actually does is it takes this data and it stores it in two places. It stores it in a um, in a serving store, which basically just collects the latest values of every feature, and it's just optimized for serving that latest value at any time whenever asked. And it also just logs it basically into a, an archive or a warehouse we call it, but it's not a data warehouse. <laughs> um, and then uh, it just contains an API server for like actually serving those models in a low latency way using an API, RESTful, or gRPC. And then it also contains this sort of feast core, which does the registration of different things and handles the metadata. So this is another interesting point. Oops. So metadata is kind of like a buzzword today, but I think um, I'm actually going to be talking a lot tomorrow about metadata with people because I think Feast can greatly benefit, greatly be simplified by taking advantage of that as much as possible. So we're going to talk about that. And it also contains some sort of sugar with the CLI and a Python SDK. So uh, the actual architecture is pretty much this. So basically, you have a warehouse store, and that currently has to be BigQuery, which is like obviously pretty limiting. We do not want to only support BigQuery. Uh, actually, I think the obvious solution is just files. Um, and uh, the serving store is currently only Bigtable <laughs> or Redis. Uh, so we want to implement Cassandra, which is going to be very easy to do. But I think implementing something which does the things we want for training with, that isn't BigQuery will be a bit trickier. Uh, the ingestion jobs are sort of all Apache Beam. So, uh, Apache Beam is great because it runs on Flink or it runs on um, on Dataflow, so you can sort of use a managed service or you can run it on prem. Um, and so that that reads streaming data with the same model as it reads batch data, so that's like quite nice. And um, yeah, the serving API, it's just an API. Uh, so one thing to note is it's all in Java, which may make some people unhappy, but it, it's kind of a necessity for Beam, and it's sort of kind of nice to be able to share some code between Beam and some of the other parts, but we'll see. <laughs> and um, although the, the client, there's a client SDK which is written in Python, and then there's a CLI written in Go, which is a bit, <laughs> it's a bit funny. Um, so just a, a sort of an example of what maybe running Feast might actually look like. Um, so this is running an ingestion job. So you specify a, a YAML file, and you just say what type it is. This is a file CSV, rather than say, you know, BigQuery table. And then you specify some options. This is a path. And then you specify, you know, the fields of your uh, CSV. And so the things that say feature ID are what says this is a feature. And the other things, such as name ID, name timestamp, can be referenced in the schema to pull out entity IDs and timestamps. So every row gets sort of timestamped with something, and that is used to determine what the latest one is. Right? Uh, and everything, every row also has to have an ID. So that's why you have these extra sort of fields um, marking that. Uh, this doesn't say anything about types, and that is because at the moment, you actually have to register a feature in advance, which we recognize as incredibly tedious. And we're trying to figure out a way to make that a more pleasant experience. But uh, basically, you have to create these different feature files which say basically what your type is, value type, in 64 in this case. And so um, a lot of this could be inferred, especially for something like a source from like a Parquet file or a BigQuery table. Like you can, you obviously know what the types are. Uh, but if you want to have extra metadata, then you have to be a bit more specific. Uh, a feature has to be associated with a driver as well. 
So in an import job, you can only import one entity at a time. Um, here's an example using BigQuery. So it's pretty much the same, except in this case, these are the fields are actually really selectors. It doesn't actually have to be exclusive. It doesn't have to map the whole import. Um, and then uh, here's an example of uh, the actual serving SDK. So this is basically just a little Python library which says, given a set of feature names, I would like a data. I would like some. I would like the features for these entities. So it's oops, 101, 102, and then it gives you back some sort of equivalent of a JSON blob. It also includes timestamps. It's a pretty weird format, but um, yeah, we're iterating. <laughs> and um, the training is very, like the, the key here is we're trying to make it as similar as possible between training and serving. So in training, we have the same uh, feature set, and then we create data sets out of that, which is basically a time bound on that. And that basically gives you, a, in this case, it gives you a data frame of all that. But we'll work on um, actually exporting that to a file. Um, so what's next? So uh, I'm not sure if anyone's actually had a look at, we had a blog post about this a while back. Uh, and still, there is no documentation. Like, it's really badly documented. We apologize. <laughs> um, we still have an open issue, which is apparently progressing, but it's not. <laughs> and um, But I think that is our biggest obstacle. Like, in terms of getting feedback, it's very hard for people to get feedback if they can't try it. Right? But that is our uh, immediate goal. And then um, we would like to make an actual stable release. Gojek has an internal release that they're using. And they are using it in production, but they're not. Uh, there's not like a stable public release that everyone can use. It's basically master, which is broken right now, I think. Well, I think it is working, actually. Yeah. And then um, we do have a, a GitHub issue for proposing a feature store to Kubeflow. Uh, it is not in the sense of an architecture. It's more like, hey, feast, maybe. So um, I think the immediate goal we've been thinking about is um, rather than say, hey, feast is we think should be the feature store, we think we should propose a document which says, here's the architecture for a feature store we think might be a useful one for Kubeflow. And then we can get people to chime in and tear it apart. Because I'm pretty sure it will not suit everybody's needs. And then there's, um, there's some optimizations that you may not sort of buy into, such as um, you know, having, it, at the moment, it's basically data has to come into the feature store. It's not something that it can like, pull data from places. and that. That's up for discussion on like what's good there. And um, yeah, and so I think a key thing that might help make Qflow, or sorry, Feast a simpler, more sort of uh, extendable or useful thing will be if we can um, integrate well with the Qflow metadata. Um, and there's some like weird cleanup stuff, which if you are looking at the source code, you'll see some weird stuff that will go away. Uh, I just want to make, briefly mention this bottom one, which is done now, but it's basically we used to serve, like the serving store used to actually serve historical values. So in the sense that, you know, you could ask for, hey, give me the latest values of a feature, but you could also ask for the last 10 values of that feature since yesterday or something like that. And that was mostly hacked. Like it turns out that's not something that people really consider a feature. I'd uh, be un interested if you think that is a feature to talk to you. But um, we found that in general, people were using that to, um, or people said they wanted that because they basically didn't want to do feature engineering. They wanted to do it in the model. And so we made a decision to just remove it because it really did make things way more complicated. Um, so please, if you have any questions, please ask now. But also um, email me if you just want to talk about feature stores uh, or you want to uh, tell me about the feature store you're building <laughs> so we can collaborate. And um, we also have a Slack channel on Kubeflow. <laughs>